Welcome to Rainer Avenue Radio's Call to Conscience, a celebration and education of Black History Month. I'm Jasmine Kendrick, and all month long in February, we will be showcasing musical performances, dance exhibitions, race and justice discussions, and workshops. Every Friday, we host our Friday Family Black Film Night, showcasing films by Black filmmakers. We'll bring you Black celebrations from around the world, including Africa, France, and British Columbia, Canada. This comprehensive celebration, which will also explore the Hartsfield Slave Quilt Collection, the 100 year anniversary of the destruction of Black Wall Street, and interviews with Seattle Black history makers, is all powered by, and thanks to, the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle. Today's guest with me is Eddie Wright Jr., Seattle community activist and civil rights leader. So thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Rai. Um, it's an honor to be meeting with you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be on the air with you. So I'm sure you know Rainier Avenue Radio is doing all kinds of fun programs and things like that to help celebrate Black History Month. But I love to start things off by asking, what does Black History Month mean to you? Because it is different for everyone and it has changed and how you like to celebrate it or how you like to honor our history. Well, actually, uh, as far as I'm concerned, every day is uh, Black History Day. So the month is special, um, selected because it was uh, the, the month uh, that Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln were both born. As Carter G. Woodson started out initially, it was Black History Week. And then eventually it went to Black History Month. But uh, it's important uh, that uh, uh, Black history is American history. And unfortunately for too long, uh, our contributions have been left out uh, of the history books. As a matter of fact, today, uh, even in some states and some textbooks uh, and some programs dealing with uh, uh, diversity and inclusion are excluded in some states. But then again, once again, uh, last month, we really saw the need for black history because we really saw the kind of racism that's prevalent in this country. I mean, when people can parade around with Confederate flags, when they can totally disrespect democracy, when they can try to overturn an election, uh, what kind of chance will the African descent of the United States enslaved have of going from an apprenticeship program to being to the journey level or getting a contract, or who decides to get a ticket, or even more serious than that, who decides is going to get shot by the police. So the thing about it is that, uh, that uh, our issues were put on full display January 6th. If people have no respect for the democracy, if they can seek to overturn the election, the, all the laws put in the civil rights laws and stuff are absolutely meaningless. Uh, to black people in this country, especially African descendants, United States enslaved. You have to be very specific about that. As my daughter say, we built this joint for free and uh, we still have yet to uh, have that NSF check made good that Dr. King referred to in his 1963 uh, speech on the March on Washington for uh, Jobs and Justice. So uh, it really uh, illuminated around the world the kind of racism that we've been confronted with for 400 years uh, because we have laws in place, and then we have unlawful uh, law enforcement officers. And that's why you see a situation where uh, uh, Dylan Ruth could go into Mother Emanuel Church and kill nine people, and the police take him to, to uh, Burger King to get a hamburger on the way to go to jail. Uh, so the people that were insurrectionists seeking to overthrow the government, when they went back home, they got a chance to go home. They didn't go to jail. As a matter of fact, one person gets to go on vacation to Mexico and they tried to overturn the government. So, you know, it's the same thing when you saw that scandal a couple of years ago where the parents were paying, the fluent parents were paying all this money to get their kids in Stanford and the USC and stuff like that. You know, a brother would get more time for stealing the Snickers out of a mini mart than they got for overturning and corrupting the entire academic system. And, you know, they get three months, four weeks in jail, two weeks in jail, and it's just the white privilege over and over again in every aspect of American life. You're absolutely correct. Thank you for saying that. Now, um, speaking of that, actually, kind of leading into my next question, um, a lot of people love to think that, you know, Washington State or that Seattle is very progressive, and it is in many ways, um, but 
I'm sure you know, just as I know, there's been experiences and things that have happened. Um, is there anything that happened to you or any experiences that you had that really reminded you while you were growing up? You're like, oh, I am a black man existing in these in these spaces and kind of like how that affected you or how you maneuvered that or, or yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, being as old as I am, at one point in time, about 80% uh, of the black people lived in the central area of Seattle. If they didn't live in High Point, Holly Park, or Yasla Terrace. Okay, and what happened there, even uh, uh, and folks were close to jobs, uh, the central area in the last uh, 20 years went from 70% 70, 70 black to 17% black. And it's all because of economic apartheid is what I call it. Uh, when you look at the fact that uh, we have not had affirmative action in this state since 1998. And for the last 20 years, uh, uh, companies owned by African descendants of the United States and slaves have done less than one tenth of 1% with the state agencies and most public agencies because they count everybody else in the federal government. Now, they count white women as minorities. Needless to say, 80% of the federal are white women. Okay, so that's why I'm pushing right now to right that wrong by having a category, uh, a federally mandated and recognized uh, category for African descendants of the United States enslaved. If you can do it for white women, how come you can't do it for black people? Okay, so I just want equality. But in, when I grew up in in, the, in, uh, in Seattle, it was uh, we all lived in one area, and uh, there, you know, if you uh, even uh, were walking somewhere outside of your area, the police would pull you over unless you. And if you worked in that neighborhood, because at one point in time, a lot of uh, black women primarily were uh, uh, taking care of other people's houses. That was out uh, the way that we made livings. Uh, then there, there are a lot of people, my, my family came up from Louisiana. My father was a Pullman porter. Uh, he came up here, A. Philip Randolph uh, designated him to be one of the Northwest organizers for the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the only union that a black man could belong in those days. Uh, so that's how we got to Seattle from Louisiana. But uh, growing up, uh, most of our folks went to Garfield uh, or Franklin and a few to Cleveland. Um, and uh, and then in 1973, I was on a, a committee called the Central Seattle Community Council Housing Federa uh, Federation. I chaired the housing committee. And in 1973, we dropped the first report on redlining of the, of the central area of Seattle. And it ballooned out and it went all the way back to Washington, D.C. At that point in time, President Gerald Ford sent the Secretary of HUD, Carla Hills, out to meet with us in Seattle. But we, they, they planned, this plan to remove black folks from the central area had been in place for a long time. But then again, if a group is doing one-tenth of one percent of the contracts and the business, uh, you're not going to do very well. And also, if uh, you don't play sports, you have a hard time getting a lot of these universities. And I think that's a, a, a lot of reasons a lot of our, uh, real, you know, a lot of our folks go to the historic black college universities, which is great too, because when you look at the percentage of uh, uh, the medical profession, uh, uh, professors, uh, a, lot, both, uh, the highest, a great percentage of those folks came from HBCU. So it's something that I support. But back in the day growing up, uh, you knew your place. But on the other hand, we did have thri a thriving black business community up Madison, up Union. And uh, uh, there was ownership. And, you know, that's just been completely depleted. And we're just going down the tubes in terms of ownership. And that's uh, just a part of that economic apartheid. And then when you have people that's, you know, making decisions, people who have that, uh, people that storm the, uh, the capital, people of that ill, a black person will never get uh, any uh, fairness. Uh, discrimination will always be there. And then when you have a person, uh, their same mindset investigating this discrimination, there'll never be a satisfactory remedy for you. Right, right. No, you're absolutely right there. Now you did mention that you're you moved up here because your dad was a part of a Pullman Porters Union. Yeah, the Brotherhood. He's called the Brotherhood. He was a Northwest organizer, right? And so, like you were saying, that was the only space that for a black man at that time. Now, was that well, the union? The union, but uh, uh, Boeing, the shipyards, and then uh, the fact that military brought a lot of blacks up here too: Fort Lewis, McCord, uh, Bremerton, the naval 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 shipyard. Uh, those were employment opportunities that got folks off the plantation, off sharecropping, 
to be able to come up here and uh, be, uh, we're middle class for a long time. And then uh, things started, that, that racism kicked back in. <laughs> now, was that something like you seeing your dad do that or like being surrounded by that, was that something that was able to inspire you or that kind of like sparked, sparked your uh, fire for the activism or what made that such a important thing for you? Well, a long time ago, um, I joined uh, the Washington National Guard. Mm. And uh, if I joined, you joined before you were 18 and a half, you only had to go to reserve meetings for like six, three years. Everybody else had to go six. And I went down to Fort Ord. Uh, I was a, one of the youngest people in the company. And I won the proficiency test of being the best soldier in the company. And then we went there and all the medical training was in at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas. So I got this bubbling pride. I'm going to go to Officers Canada School because I've been the top gun down in, at Fort Ord. And uh, uh, you get off the plane, I'm getting a drink of water. All of a sudden I hear a voice say, hey boy, you can't drink out the white man's water pump. And I got military fatigues on. And, uh, you know, I, I was doing well. And then we got ready to take the Christmas break. And that time some of the reservists could have cars. And it just so happened a black guy and a white guy in the same unit in Kansas City. And I had an aunt in Kansas City. So I was, we were going there for the Christmas break. So I went and jumped in the front seat with the, with the white guy and the brother says, you can't ride in the front seat with a white man until you get, we get to, to get to Kansas. And then about two weeks after that, we get back and I go to the movies uh, downtown San Antonio with my military green outfit on, my dress greens, go to the, slap my money down. And the lady says, boy, that uniform don't make you white. Go to the colored window. So while I'm sitting there talking, uh, two APs, two brothers from the uh, Air Force, pull me over and say, we're going to give you a ride back to, to the base. You're going to get in trouble. So when I'm getting out of their car, the uh, MP saw me and I wanted to know why they were giving me a ride. Mm -hmm. So they told him what happened. And then the company commander came in. And after that, uh, -uh the Officers Canada School was in Georgia. I said, no, I'm not going back. But so that's one of the things that it made me very conscientious. And, uh, and I, think, I, I think, you know, following Dr. King, and, and following the civil rights movement mm -hmm. and thinking that, you know, you know, we finally, and this is 50, we finally overcame. And uh, not really, not at all. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of promises, but very little implementation. And the thing about it is that uh, uh, a lot of people, you know, some folks got some jobs and thought that, you know, this is the way it is. But if you really look at where we are as a people, uh, not only in this city and state, but in this country, uh, we're making some strides, but there, we have so much f further to go. We've paid so many dues and had such such little, like Dr. King said, that NS check is there. And uh, we just have to, we just have to really, I mean, we've, we've made it this far. Like uh, the late Dr. Evan McKinney told me, he said, you know, Brother Rye, you and I wouldn't have made it during slavery. We'd have been hung the first week. And I said, probably so, but, uh, but you know, praise the Lord, uh, we've been able to, sustain and see a lot of things happen, but uh, I'm just so happy, I have to say it, it was really sad what happened last month in Washington, D.C., yeah. at the Capitol, but all that's a reflection, you know, people talking about, we're going to, we this country has always been divided, that racism has always been here, and if people think that it's going to go away, they have another thought coming, uh, what has to happen is we have to have economic justice, and we have to have respect, and we got to have, uh, we got to cease with unlawful law enforcement and people who are affiliated with any of these hate groups got to get off law enforcement and the secretary of defense, that brother got to get rid of all of the boogaloo boys and the, uh, <laughs> uh, the proud boys and the white supremacists and the military. They need to go. They need to go. I absolutely agree. They're, they're doing nothing but continuing to cultivate the, the, the nastiness that's been just uh what's it called I, the 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 fire has been lit the last four years and they're just cultivating that that's that's all that they're doing um but i was gonna that actually led me to another question that i had you know that was that's a much like larger a larger scale of course but um as far as locally and what you've seen here and the change over the course of you know you living here um what what ways have you seen positive change? I know we've talked about, you know, the um, gentrification or you had a nice word for it, financial or 
No, economic apartheid. Economic apartheid, thank you. Um, besides that, you know, what have you seen change for good or for bad? And what more would you like to see done? Oh, you know, we've had, uh, you know, uh, African-American mayor, you know, uh, Norman Rice. Uh, we've had Ron Sims, the African-American county executive, uh, African-American uh, city council president, Bruce Hero. So we also, like right now, we have a uh, uh, Joanne Hero. I think she's chair of the Board of Regents at UW. Uh, Dr. Constance uh, Williams Rice mm -hmm. is also on, on, on the board. So uh, I've seen uh, folks who I thought were really taken off when I saw my, my boss, uh, Dr. Rosalind Woodhouse, who was the former executive director of camp. She was the director of camp when I uh, was at the house. She allowed me to do a lot of things. She would always say, Eddie, why is the mayor's office calling me? But, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but she, she also was the president and CEO of the Urban League Metropolitan in Seattle. And she was the one that bought the building they were in that they end up, we had to resell. But she did that. She also was the, the uh, appointed to be the, uh, the, uh, the uh, director of the Department of Licenses under Governor Dixie Lee Ray. Uh, and then, you know, uh, we had, uh, at one time, uh, uh, the late Councilman Sam Smith, you know, he was in the legislature. And uh, matter of fact, uh, Councilman Sam Smith and uh, the late doctor, I mean, they're both late now, Dr. Arthur Allen Fletcher, who's known as the father of affirmative action. They were the two blacks, the first two uh, blacks to win citywide elections. Dr. Fletcher won in Pasco, Washington, and Sam Smith won in, in Seattle, Washington. Uh, but then again, you know, we go back to, uh, where we are now in, in the gentrification, the economic apartheid has just pushed uh, our numbers out. But when you look at it, uh, we have representation where we are, like uh, in the city of Renton, for example, Ed Prince is on the Renton City Council and I'll probably leave some people out. And then we go to uh, uh, the Auburn area, Doc, uh, Deborah Entman is on uh, state representative and the federal way area, uh, uh, attorney Jamila Taylor and uh, Jesse Johnson or state reps out there. And uh, in Tacoma, you know, because uh, a lot of folks are, are from Seattle uh, and not only just black folks, but other folks are moving to Tacoma. And Tacoma has uh, the mayor and deputy mayor are both, are both black. And okay. then uh, they have an organization that meets every Saturday called the Black Elective, where a number of folks who are elected officials, appointed officials and other community leaders come together and uh, it's one of the most cohesive units of black folks I've ever seen anywhere. And they do get things done. That's important. Yeah, why it is, yeah. Very important. And I don't yeah. know why more, you know, different cities and bodies of government aren't adopting that. That's one of the best ways to get things done, especially for our people. Yeah. But you know, you had mentioned something else about things changing. Uh, there are a couple of things that we got time that I'd like to mention. Uh, <laughs> Got about 10 more minutes. Go ahead. Okay. In, uh, in 1941, the Daughters of Confederacy named uh, Highway 99 the Jefferson Davis Highway. They named it for the Confederate president from the Canadian border to the Oregon border. And they had a big uh, e events there with members of the legislature and put a marker at, the, at Blaine at the Canadian border and one in Vancouver. And a, a gentleman by the name of Representative Hans Dunshee. And uh, my friend Hayward Evans and I, we worked with him uh, to get that name off. He wanted to name, change the name for William P. Stewart, who was a black Civil uh, War veteran fighting for the Union armies buried in Stonebridge County. And uh, anyway, the Washington State Transportation Committee, well, only part of the, the, the uh, highway was named for him. So they put uh, Stewart's uh, sign up right by the Everett Mall, and they named the whole highway. And they said, no, it wasn't. I said, well, why would you have a ceremony at the Canadian border and one in Vancouver, Washington at the Oregon border. But anyway, we're still fighting that for the transfer. The other thing that happened is a gentleman by the name of uh, 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 Jonathan Rosenblum. And you know that Jefferson Davis Highway was on all the maps. So they're supposed to have taken it off. Okay, oh, gotcha. I wanna let you know that. And the other thing is a, friend, a guy I worked with over the years, his name is Jonathan Rosenblum. He's uh, I think on, he's on uh, city council member Shana Sawan's staff now. But his uh, family had, uh, his wife's family had some property up in the, the North Cascades in Chelan. And he kept seeing the sign saying Coon Lake and Coon Creek. So he finally asked uh, one of the neighbors, 
uh, I never seen any raccoons around here, so what's up? And so the neighbor said, we're talking about a different kind of coon. So anyway, Jonathan Rosenblum got busy and found out it was Howard Lake and Howard Creek. Uh, a brother was a prospector and a miner and it homesteaded the lake and the creek. And it was, uh, until he died, it was Howard Lake and Howard Creek. And through Jonathan's efforts, they restored the name uh, for, to Howard Creek and Howard Lake. So those are some of the things that are still happening. And That's this year was like two or three years ago. Yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, so I mean, just saying, you know, uh, we got, uh, in 2017, they took the uh, Jefferson Davis na uh, name off. And I think it was in 20, 2016, I think, they put uh, uh, Wilson Howard's name back on his lake and his creek. So we still have that stuff. It's here, it's alive and well. You know, we, we had people from Oregon and Washington, including six police officers from Seattle Police Department. They were in Washington on January 6th. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think I would get a fair break if those guys stopped me from anything. I don't think, I don't really think they would care if they pr would protect me or another black person or not. I mean, I'm just, just saying, if you go back, uh, you know, waving the Confederate flag with white supremacists, with Proud Boys, with mm -hmm. neo-Nazis, and uh, the Boogaloo Boys, and all these folks, uh, no, nah, I'm very sorry. Uh, no, you can't protect me. And if you're in the military, uh, I wouldn't, I'd repeat my eye on you just as much as I would the enemy. Right. Now you were talking about, uh, just, I want to backtrack just a little bit, because you were talking about how, you know, you were helping with getting these, you know, names restored, like petitions to get things back to proper names or respectful, respectfully done so. Um, you were heavily involved with getting the, you know, MLK's image on our King County logo, as well as getting Empire Way renamed to MLK Way, which I've only ever known as MLK, uh, by the way. So like- I understand this a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> what? What was that? What was that like back then? Like, was was the support rough? You know, was it was it like a constant battle, or what did that look like for you? Well, uh, it started in 1960. I was, I mean, 1980. I was hosting a radio program on KYAC Radio, which is was downtown at the time, and uh, Stevie Wonder was having an event uh, that was in. Uh, this was the latter part of November, and uh, Stevie Wonder was having an event uh, January 15th, 81 to uh, impress Congress to make Dr. King's birthday a national holiday. So since we were so far away, Reverend Jackson suggested we do something locally. So the next uh, uh, next four or five months with uh, Clarence Williams, the black firefighters, members of the clergy, uh, we started a little petition drive. We pre presented those petitions in April of 81 and they studied and studied and all of a sudden they came back. Okay, we'll change the name. We'll change it from uh, Madison to Denny. That was the first proposal. The second proposal, and I saw my Facebook page right now, that, that, that whole deal. And the second proposal was to change from Denny to Yester. And the third proposal was to change it from Yester to, to uh, Rainier. So that was because uh, merchants on the South End had uh, complained about it. And in 82, when the city council voted and the mayor, Charles Royer, signed into the law in August of 82, uh, the merchants filed a lawsuit which prevented the city from putting the signs up. So we had all these protests. And matter of fact, one Saturday, uh, a guy made up a whole bunch of signs. We just plastered over the Empire Way signs and the Martin Luther King Way signs. And then uh, in January of 83, uh, we had a uh, the first, first Martin Luther King march to protest the city not putting up the Martin Luther King signs and demanding Congress make Dr. King's birthday a national holiday. So fast forward to November 2nd, President Ronald Reagan signed legislation that Dr. King's birthday would be a holiday the third Monday in 1986. Well, four weeks later, the Washington State Supreme Court ruled that the city of Seattle had the authority to change the name of Empire Way to Martin Luther King Way. Now, all during this time, a lot of people were saying, well, there were some black folks that were opposed to it as well. Uh, but, uh, and then most of the media was opposed to it as well. They all, well, why don't you name something else? And there was a guy, uh, Congress, uh, City Council member, George Benson was chair of uh, the Transportation Committee. He and Sam Smith said, don't make any compromises. Naming half the street is a half an honor. We're not going for it. That was a board of public works who had that proposal. He said, we're not going for it. And uh, then Bob Morgan, who was a staff guy for on the Transportation Committee, he said, Eddie, don't let him make a change. He said, Empire Way 
is State Highway 900, they'll have to put MLK way signs up on the freeway. So uh, anyway, that, that was that story. And now the other thing you mentioned was, uh, it wasn't just the logo, we had to get the legislature to change the name uh, from William Rufus B. Devaney King, who was a slave owner. And we had to, we had to go to the legislature because what happened in, uh, after Ronald Reagan had made his pronouncement, uh, 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 then King County Council Member Ron Sims and Bruce Olson, a Democrat Republican, they uh, put together a proclamation proclaiming uh, the name of uh, King County to be Martin Luther King County. So in 1999 at the Martin Luther King event, I said it's been 13 years, nobody really knows this is King County. Uh, I would like to put a motion on the floor, it's about 2,500 people, that Council Member Larry Gossett uh, proceed to see what we have to do to officially change the name of the county to Martin Luther King Jr. County. So as it turns out, only the legislature could change the name of a county. So Senator Adam Klein introduced legis legislation about eight different times. So finally in uh, 2005, uh, the legislature passed the, the law and Governor Christine Gregoire came up to Martin Luther King Jr. County Courthouse and signed the legislation. And then so many people were opposed to the, uh, the logo being the image of Dr. King, it took us about 18 months to twist arms to say, oh no, the county's named for him because uh, some of the members on the county council want to have a picture of the county courthouse. I said, that, that looks like Martin Luther King Jr. to me. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, the late Tony Gable uh, was, and uh, was in, it was, uh, he was art, he, he was the artist and uh, Vivian, Vivian Phillips was the coordinator and leader and uh, so uh, that's how that came about. So that's how we ended up with, with that. And the only municipality in the country named for Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, is uh, right here and Seattle is in it. Yeah, I had no idea that it was for a former slave owner. That just blows my mind. I had no idea. Well, come on, let's face it. Now, George Washington, right. Thomas Jefferson. You know, right. The guy that wrote the Star Spangled <laughs> Banner. I mean, you know, we had to deal with it. And then he turned back around and there's monuments to Robert E. Lee. We did have Highway 90 name, um, nine name for Jefferson Davis. And I mean, Robert E. Lee uh, was a traitor. Jefferson Davis was a traitor, but because they're white people, that's, that's all it is to it. Mm -hmm. They get exception. White privilege has always been prevalent in America, continues to be in last month in, in Washington, D.C. when nobody got arrested. They just, the guards opened the gates for them. You know, I'm just saying, you know, if that Black Lives Matter would have made it to the front, the front step. They wouldn't have. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Well, Mr. Rye, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. It was such an honor to have you here. Um, the conversation was very insightful. Thank you. Thank um, you very much. Of course. Again, you guys can catch all musical performances, dance exhibitions, race and justice discussions, and workshops to celebrate Black History Month all month long in February. Visit the Rainier Avenue Radio website for a schedule of events. Until next time, goodbye, everybody.